look at polling and you talk to Americans, they seem to have lost confidence in you, trust in you, your, your credibility has taken a hit. If I was interested in polling, I wouldn't have run for president. But doesn't but, that but, undermine the and, public trust? And, and you're, you're conflating, first of all, me and, and, and Mr. He's Clapper. And he's saying. still on the job. What I'm saying is this, that yes, these are tough problems that I am glad to have the privilege of tackling. I'm sure that I will have even better ideas uh, after a, a couple days of uh, sleep and sun. <laughs> <laughs> President, thinking about his year in Hawaii right now, and how about that press conference on Friday? The first question, was it the worst year of the Obama presidency? He didn't answer. Does anybody here disagree with the idea that it was the worst? No, I mean, I think it's by if you take a look at the data, if you take a look where he was at the start of the year, just think a year ago today, he was winning a 50 percent plus victory. First person since Eisenhower to win two terms over 50 percent. Everything seems so great. And ever since the start of the second administration, it has gone down. He's gone from a net. He's dropped a net 25 points in 12 months since January to today. It's his presidency, in my view, and the credibility of his presidency and the relevancy of his presidency is dramatically in question today, and I think he can't recover from it. Cannot recover? He cannot no, recover from it. The, no president has ever recovered from it at this point in their presidency. I, I think he can. He has three years to recover. I think he will have a rebound in, in 2014, especially if the economy continues to rebound. Look, four of the last uh, five two-term presidents have experienced problems in their fifth year. So call he's it got a, the lowest average polling of all of them. Of any president. Well, Richard Nixon, any, George no, He's w. got a lower, lower overall number than any president. Okay, well, uh, that, that, I don't want to sound like I'm disputing your numbers today, but I'll do it later. <laughs> but, but I, I, I believe if, if, the, if the rollout of the health care bill continues to bring in more people, if he can get the story right, if people are feeling good about the economy, this president will rebound. Look, he averted a war in Syria this year. I think the president has enormous strengths, and, I, and he's resilient. He's been counting out before. He'll come back. And so much of the, of the, of the difficult year, Bill Crystal, is because of that health care, you know, the, in the botched rollout, Peggy Noonan's uh, word of the year, and the fact that it's been slow in getting people to sign up. Some of us think it's a botched law, and I would say it's maybe been politically the worst year of his presidency, but I actually think for the country the worst year of his presidency was 2010, and the worst day was March 23rd, 2010, when he signed the health care legislation and said, on the very day he signed it, I'd just like to remind people of this one more time, I said this once or twice, but it bears repeating. If you like your current insurance, you will keep your current insurance. Nobody is changing what you've got if you're happy with it. If you like your doctor, you'll be able to keep your doctor. But he said that on the day he signed the law. It was false. And, you know, the worst thing in politics, you can get away with misleading people if the result is pretty good. You can get away with a bad result sometimes if people think you've been sincere and honest and trying to pursue a policy that you honestly felt was right. The combination of misleading and a bad result, and the results yeah. are going to keep getting worse, Steve, incidentally, for the next few months. I think that's devastating. PolitiFact called that the lie of the year. How do you explain how it was allowed to stand for so long? Honestly, George, I can't. I've thought about it over and over again. I've asked friends of mine in the White House how this could happen because there were people who knew this. In fact, there were people in the press and some actually pointed it out. And yet, over and over again, the president was allowed to go out there and say that. And I think that was really unfortunate. But I do think, and I, without disagreeing with what we said earlier about this being the worst uh, year of his presidency, I do think the day will come when people will look at the Affordable Care Act and say this was a landmark piece of legislation just the way they look at Medicare today. We're going to tinker with it. We're going to fix it. I think ultimately it's going to work. It's going to insure 25 million people who don't have insurance today. And we're going to look back and say, how could we not have done something for those that people? That is the big question, isn't it, Greta? It is. But let me just, let me just say to you, is that how could he keep saying that over and over again? Why do he keep saying the thing about the Benghazi and the tapes over and over again after long after? I know why he keeps saying these different things. But the president's most powerful weapon as president has been his ability to inspire that that's his greatest strength. And then he comes out last Friday in the, um, on the press conference. He was depressing. He was like, uh, you know, as pathetic. He, he sucked the oxygen out of the room. The media beat up on him. The media had bad questions. They kept punching him. I mean, he, he ends the year where you just want to slit your throat almost because it was so depressing. And he's completely lost his ability to inspire. And that 40 percent approval rate, I mean, it's just, I mean, or, uh, disapproval rate, it just shows how, you know, how he has lost, you know, his ability to, George, to really it's inspire. It's more, but it's more disappointment like than, than it, the people he's lost, the people that, uh, are, are now waiting for him to suit up, so to speak, to, to face these challenges. They're the people who, they, they are hopeful that he will come back because they're dependent on him to fight for them. Fight but he for wasn't fighting even on Friday, uh, Donna. He, he, he was, came out at the end of the year and he thought, 
Really? I well, mean, this and, is this is someone who's coming out and selling to, himself? To me, one of the best lines, which is so telling, is whenever a president, it was almost word for word what George W. Bush used to say in year five and in year six, when he said, if I paid attention to polling, I wouldn't have run for president. Anytime a president says that, means they're on the opposite side of polling, it, where they stand in this country. To me, I know we've talked about Obamacare. I sit on the board mm -hmm. of a charity hospital. I think there's some very good elements of Obamacare that are going to provide a lot of good things for the country. It's not fully about Obamacare. To me, what the, what's going on in the country right now, now is one they question the president's ability to manage anything the government as a whole and his competency to manage it and whether or not they trust him the other thing is we've seen a lot of good economic signs in this country we have the GDP up the stock markets at record, record highs, high. but the majority of the country does not feel any real impact it's been over a generation since there's been any real increase in their financial situation the president won't get credit until the majority of the country but, feels benefited. Can I say two things about that? First of all, I don't disagree with your analysis of the polling. We can argue about the specific numbers later. <laughs> but his 40 or 41 percent approval rating, Congress's approval rating, 13 percent. It's very hard to be an effective president when you have a dysfunctional, divided government up on Capitol Hill and you can't get business well, done. And, and that gets to the question, is there anything the president and Congress could do you know, to address the problem that Matthew just talked about, this problem of uh, a lot of long people who been unemployed for an awful long time, not getting out of long-term unemployment, and for most Americans, their incomes have been stagnant for a generation. There's a thousand things that Congress could do. Matthew's analysis of the problem is exactly right. That is the problem, that people's incomes have not gone up. I don't think that's the president's fault. He will get tagged for it. There's a thousand things Congress could do. We could have a budget that actually made sense, where we weren't cutting investments in education and R&D and infrastructure, all the things that actually bring hope for a more productive economy and more income growth. And instead, we're doing these mini budget deals that are just sort of kicking the can further and further down the road. So there's when a thousand I, things we could do. When I hear Steve say there are a thousand things Congress can do, I reach for my wallet. And I think an increasing number of Americans do. Look, I think it could be, uh, this is a big debate that will kind of go on for uh, two, three, four years, maybe longer. Was Obamacare a, a landmark moment, as Steve said, where we all look back later on and say, how could we not have done that earlier? Or is it a landmark moment where we say, you know what, this was the experiment in big government liberal social engineering it failed. It failed in execution. It failed in concept. And let's stop trying to have government. But then, no, let's let's, stop. Look, let's look, enough minute, already Bill. with these 44, attempts. 44,000 people lost their health insurance because the provider changed the policy prior to Obamacare. This has been going on in the individual marketplace for decades. What Obamacare is doing is stabilizing there are the ways marketplace. To fix. There, are, there were targeted ways to fix that, and that's not what Obamacare but then is let's look well, at some, let's, so We do have some evidence right now. It's, it's, it's inconclusive, but as the president said on Friday, more than a million people have now signed up right. for Obamacare. It's short of about the three million goal for and the And how end. many of those are in Medicaid? These are people who signed up on the exchanges. Okay. These are people who signed up on the exchanges. We do know that health care costs, the growth of health care costs has been slowing. We do know that the deficit has been going down. And we do know, Greta, that uh, people who couldn't get insurance before now can get insurance. So there's arguments on either side here. Well, I, look, I'm for everyone having access to health care, but it's got to be a smart method to achieve health care. And when you have five million get dumped, if you destabilize so many American people that they're all worried, if you call for a doctor and you can't get an appointment for two or three months, whatever, whatever the reason is, but just because we have a terrible situation, a health situation in our country where we definitely need reform, doesn't necessarily mean we should pursue a program that may not work. And I think the president, by allowing some people not to pay the mandate, his announcement the other day, I think was an admission that it really isn't working for everybody, that there are a lot of problems. And so, I, look, I'm for everyone having access to health care. I'm not convinced, and I don't think the numbers show it, that we're going to be able to support this, because I don't think the young and healthy are going to come in droves and sign up. Maybe they will. I hope they do, but and I'm not optimistic. That's the lesson in Massachusetts. They waited till the last minute to sign up, and I think that'll be the lesson. And the we'll deadline to get in insurance so. for, for this year is tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and I guess one of the big questions, Steve, is as, you, as, you, as we go forward, are these people going to sign up over the, over the next year or is the mandate going to continue to get chipped, chipped away? Well, I do worry a little bit about it simply because all this negative publicity has caused people to step back and say, I don't know what this means. I don't know what I should do. And so I worry that the people who are opposed to the Affordable Care Act, to Obamacare, may make this into a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think the experience in Massachusetts that Donna just referred to, 98.5% of the people in Massachusetts now have health insurance. Or can I just say one thing about what Bill said about this big government versus little government argument? I agree. That's an important debate. We had eight years of little government under George W. Bush. It did not help oh, this economy. Oh, it wasn't economy. that little. It did not, it didn't, yeah, well, it wasn't it that was, little government. Well, he was your guy. He was your guy. He was your guy. <laughs> we did not have a great economic result. It ended in the financial crisis. Incomes went down. The deficit went up. 
I don't really see how that was a great way housing. to govern this Can country. I ask you a question? The housing policy under George W. Bush was not limited government. It was the opposite, and it led to a bubble, and it led to a terrible financial clash. I agree that both parties have failed in addressing long-term unemployment and addressing the stagnation of middle-class incomes. It seems to me that the party that develops a fresh agenda on that, on that front will be in great shape for 2016. I think the right agenda is not more government, but there are reforms well, that need to happen. But I think that the party's agenda, I think this is where the Republicans have made the fault, which goes back to this previous conversation. We've created a tremendous amount of wealth in this country in the last 20 years, but only for a very few people in this country. And we just talked about a generation of people in the middle class in this country has seen no growth in income until somebody, and I know Elizabeth Warren's doing this from a populist standpoint, I think the best message for a Republican would be limited government in Washington, they're not doing their job, we can't trust them, and an attack on Wall Street, and basically saying we can't accumulate wealth on Wall Street and think it helps the middle Brother, class. Are Republicans ready to take on this inequality debate? Well, I certainly hope that. I mean, look, in 19, 1965, we started the war on poverty, and we failed uh, drastically. So whatever we did to win this war on poverty has been an abject failure. I'd like to see someone come in, much like Reagan came in and said, why don't we just win the Cold War? Why don't we just win the war on poverty? And why don't we come up with some new ideas? Because whatever we're doing is failing, and so we can't keep repeating what we're doing. Well, I, I don't, one thing on the war on yeah. poverty, for years the war on poverty dropped. Today, it's at its worst point ever, which is, I think, goes to this which is problem of in, income, income inequality. For years of the, of the, of the situation five, six, seven years, poverty dropped. And then it started rising back up when we went to a completely free market, wealth created in Wall Street system. And that's to me a big part of the problem.